Over the last few weeks, we've been in this series called How to Ruin Your Life. And if you're anything like me, there are probably moments in your life where you thought, wow, I really wish I didn't do things this way because the results didn't turn out so well. There are probably moments in your life where you thought, well, maybe I didn't make the best decision here. And many of us would love to have the opportunity to redo those moments, but unfortunately we don't have them. But we can learn how to go forward from them and see how we can improve those lives, these moments that maybe didn't go as well as we thought they would. And if you're anything like me, if you're a human being, uh, you probably also aren't a big fan of when people tell you you messed up in a moment in your life. Whether it's in your workspace where someone tells you you did a bad job or you did wrong, whether it's in your home where maybe like your children tell you they don't like what you're making for dinner, oftentimes there are moments in our lives where people will tell us how bad we've done something and we don't usually like to hear it. Sometimes there are fairly serious comments that come our way. Sometimes we did really mess up. Sometimes we really made a poor choice. And so when someone says something to us, we might get a little defensive. We might get our backs up a little. And we try to think of, how do I get out of this? How do I argue with this person, or how do I prove my point to this person that really what I did wasn't so bad, because maybe some other people have done worse, or maybe you try to get out of the responsibility for the decision you made. Probably if you're a human being, there's been at least one moment in your life where you did something And you knew it wasn't a good choice, and you tried to do everything you could to cover it up. We're going to talk about that a bit this morning. Over the last few weeks as we've been in the series, we've been looking at the life of King David. King David, who, those of us who maybe have a bit of a church background, uh, we know the stories of his life. We know one of the things that he is called, one of the terms that's called is, you know, the person after God's own heart. He's well regarded in the Bible. He's well regarded in the historic tradition of the church and in Judaism. But he also made a lot of mistakes. And we've been looking at those mistakes. Not because we want to criticize him, but because we want to learn from him. Because in his mistakes, he also made things better in the end. And we're going to talk about that more next week, about what to do once you succeed at ruining your life. But this week we're going to look at the third thing he does that causes ruin, implosion, disaster in his life. So if you're with us in the first week, we looked at how David isolates himself, and that's one of the key things we do, is we remove people from our lives who might have wisdom and insight and challenge us. So in David's life, he removes his nephew. He sends him off to war when he should have been going off to war. Someone who would challenge him, we're going to look at one of those challenges today. So he isolates himself from people who will say, hey, maybe this isn't a good idea. We also see that he let boredom lead him into a place of peril. He was supposed to be doing something. Instead, he wasn't doing it, and he starts to wander. He starts to be bored, and he starts to fill that boredom with whatever entertains him in the moment. He has a lack of fulfillment. And many of us find ourselves in that space. We got there last week talking about how sometimes that lack of fulfillment can lead us to a place of destruction, of peril, pitfall. And finally, this morning, what we're going to talk about is the third thing he does is he thinks he knows best, which I think a lot of us do. A lot of us think we know best. A lot of us think we know best about ourselves. A lot of us think we know best about anything that's on the internet because you're probably an expert in it. And at least that's what most chat rooms are like or comments on internet or Twitter or anywhere. Everybody thinks they know best. And so when you think you know best, you'll do what you can to prove that you know best. In David's life, he thought he knew best how to fix his problem. And we're going to see how actually it didn't help him at all. It made things worse. And when we have that idea of ourselves that we know best, more often than not, it leads to somewhere that's not the best. And so we're going to look at David's life, and we're going to see what he did and what we can learn from it so that we don't fall into the same traps that he did. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 11, as we've been in the last few weeks. And the beginning of chapter 11 starts like this. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. 
They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. So this is where he isolates himself. He chooses to send his most trusted person, Joab, his nephew, out to war when he should have been going out to war. Instead of him doing what he was supposed to be doing, he isolates himself. He removes the one person who might say, hey, David, what you're about to do is a bad idea. So this starts the problem. He continues, he says, One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a beautiful woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The men said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David's got himself in this situation. He's isolated himself from people who would probably said, hey, this is a bad idea, David. You should go out to war. You should do what you're supposed to do. Do your job. As he's isolated himself, he's grown bored with the reality of like he was supposed to be doing something. He had a role. He had a purpose, and he ignored it. And so he's bored, so he's walking around and spying on a woman who's trying to become ceremonially clean. And he goes, hey, why don't I have sex with her? Because that's what his mind was doing. His mind was wandering in such a way that it wasn't to the things he was supposed to be thinking of. He wasn't thinking of his kingdom. He wasn't thinking of God. He wasn't thinking of his role. He was thinking, how do I fill this moment in time where I am bored, where I don't have anything? How do I fill it? And what I'll fill it with is her. And then she gets pregnant. He can't hide what he did if she's pregnant. So he's thinking, how do I get out of this situation? Like many of us, when we get into a situation we know we shouldn't be in, when we get into a moment of time where we do something we shouldn't have done, and there's going to be consequences to it, we think, how do I get out of it? And usually we think we know how to best do it. So sometimes it might mean that we're going to lie to get out of something. Sometimes it might mean that we just try to avoid it. Sometimes we just try to bury it and pretend like it never happened. We try to do something to show that what happened didn't actually happen or it wasn't that big of a deal. But David's faced with a situation where this woman who he slept with, who in many ways, unfortunately because of his power and prestige and the culture of the time, he took advantage of her, Uh, In many ways, people probably would have looked the other way, but he knew what he did was wrong. He knew it was wrong. So he needed to cover it up. So what does he do? Well, the text says, so David sent his word to Joab, Joab, who is his most trusted person, who's out on the front lines, who's fighting, who's doing what he should be doing. He says, he sends word to him. He says, well, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. David is thinking, hey, I got this, woman's, this woman pregnant. Why don't I bring her husband, and maybe it'll look like he got her pregnant. It's a soap opera. How do I get out of this? Well, I'm going to make it look like it never happened. So I'm going to invite this guy, and there's a specific title that's given to him, Hittite, meaning he is non-Jewish. He's actually an immigrant in this place. He was from a kingdom that was conquered and he is assimilated into the culture of Israel. He is not of the same lineage as David, not of the same lineage of people who would follow the law the same way David would say you're supposed to follow the law. But he has been assimilated into this culture and he's part of them now and he's fighting for them. And he's out fighting and David says, bring him back, Joy." Bring him back, nephew. I want him back here. Let's fix this problem. He doesn't say what the problem is, of course. He doesn't tell him what happened. But he sends for him. He says, when, when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. So he's making small talk. He's saying, hey, how are things going? 
you're doing good, you're having a good time. I don't know who would ever say they're having a good time at war, but hey, just how's it going? Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent to him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, why is he telling him to go and wash his feet? Well, he could mean go and wash your feet, but if you've been around me a while, I've talked about this before in Scripture, sometimes feet is a euphemism for something else in the Old Testament. Usually, it's about sex. So he says, go home, relax a little, spend some time with your wife. Because David's thinking, hey, Uriah, you're just a guy like me. You know, if you have the opportunity, you're going to go have sex with someone. You're just like me. Uriah the Hittite, the guy who is out fighting, who is doing what David should be doing, being in, at war, who is not culturally of the same culture as David, who does not have the same connection with God that David does, David thinks, hey, you're going to be just like me. So he brings him back, says, hey, go home, spend some time with your wife. What does Uriah do? He doesn't go home. He stays, and instead he <clears throat> excuse me, he stays uh, at the doorway. Let's continue. So Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace. It says, then David, uh, David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. David, who thinks, hey, Uriah, you're just a guy like me, is confronted by Uriah, and Uriah says, actually, I'm not. I have this level of integrity, of this understanding, of this is what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to go and abandon what I'm supposed to do. Like, yes, I'm going to listen to you because you're the king, and if you tell me to come, I'm going to come, but I have a job to do. Everybody else is out there. Why would I abandon them? Why would I give up on them like that? So it says, then David said to him, or was I there already? Uh, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. And David made him drunk. In the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. So David isn't still thinking, hey, I can get out of this. You know, he, okay, he's not like me when he's sober. Maybe if he's drunk, he'll just give in to his natural desire to go be with his wife. Maybe if I can just get him drunk, I will get out of this. But Uriah still operates with a sense of integrity, even when he's inebriated, and says, nope, I'm going to sleep on my mat. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. So he sends Uriah back and brings it to jo- with Joab. He says, in it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw him withdraw from him, so he will be struck down and die. So David's thinking, hey, I know what's best. I know how to get out of this. What I'm going to do is I am going to give him an opportunity to sleep with his wife, take him out of combat, and he's going to do it. And then he doesn't do it. And he says, okay, well, I still know what's best. Um, I'm going to get him drunk. 
And if he's drunk, he's going to go and sleep with his wife. And he still doesn't do it. So he goes, okay, well, I know what's best. I'm going to get him killed. That way I don't have to worry about it. If he's dead, no one's going to ask any questions. I'll just be taking care of the grieving widow. I'll be the nice guy. I'll be good. I won't have to deal with my guilt. I can just get rid of it. So David says, sends a letter with him. So Uriah's carrying his death certificate, saying this is what's going to happen. He sends him back, sends it to Joab, and says, <clears throat> excuse me. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. Where he knew the strongest defenders were. So Joab is told by the king, this is what you're supposed to do. So he says, okay, we're under siege. I will put him out there. I have to do it. The king tells me, if I don't do it, I'm in trouble. It says, when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. What he didn't do was isolate him. He didn't leave him to go to the slaughter. He actually disobeyed David by having the army with him and leaving it to chance that he would die. He followed David's instruction to a little bit of the letter. You got to put him out there to try and get him killed. But Joab acted in the sense of conscience and said, no, I can't do it like that. That's not right. And so he sends him out, but he does die. So Joab sent a full account of the battle to David. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, so once you tell him everything that's happened, the king's anger will flare up. And he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jeru? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Tebez? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, so he's anticipating David is going to be ticked off that he didn't actually do what he was told to do. That he didn't actually just send Uriah out to die on his own. That he actually went as an army together and in some sense tried to protect Uriah. He says, if he asks you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. So you accomplish your goal. Joab knows what's going on. He might not know the details. Probably no one has told him that David has impregnated this man's wife, but he knows there's something up. He knows David's not being the way he's supposed to be. And he knows that he is acting in such a way to bring this man back and then send him back to say, get him killed. That was not the way he was supposed to be. That wasn't right. He wasn't acting in a way that the king should have been acting. And so David, as he's trying to pile on the opportunity to get out of his mess, he's getting frustrated, he's getting angry, and Joab just senses this is going to come. He's not going to be happy about this. And so he says, just at the end, just make sure he knows that, that the guy's dead. See, what happens is that for David, he's like, he realizes he does something wrong and his integrity's all built up and he's thinking, well, my integrity's built up because I'm the king and everybody loves me, so I can do whatever I want. And so he starts off by going, hey, why don't I just... Uh, you know, send my trusted people away. And he sends them away. Sends Joab away. And he says, well, why don't I, you know, not go to war like I was supposed to go to war? And so he's, he's starting to make reasons and excuses to what he does. And he gets to the point, he's going, hey, well, how do I get out of this? He's making all these choices and these mistakes, and it's messing things up. He said, well, how do I get out of this? Well, why don't I bring him back? Why don't I try and get him to come back so he sleeps with his wife? And then if he sleeps with his wife, then I'll get out of this. No one will know. But it doesn't work out. So David goes, well, how do I get out of it? Well, why don't I decide to uh, get him drunk? If he gets drunk, he's just a guy. He'll have sex with his wife. And it doesn't work out. So he keeps going. goes, well, how do I get out of this? I got to get out of this. I can't just keep making decisions and, and hurting myself by not allowing you know, this to go on like this. And so he's like, well, I'll get him killed. So he goes to get him killed. And we do the same thing sometimes. Maybe we're not getting anybody killed, at least I hope not. 
But we try to get out of the decisions that we make that aren't always good and try to pile on either lies or deceit or something to get, our, get the attention off of us so that we don't admit we've done it. And eventually it catches up to us. Maybe it's at work and we thought, you know, like, I don't really feel like going to work today, so I'm just going to call in sick, even though the real reason is I stayed up late and I drank too much. Or maybe we think, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been hanging out with those people, but I won't tell my wife that. I'll just keep it to myself and say, hey, we just, you know, had a few friends together, no big deal, uh, nothing happened, we're all good. And we keep piling things on thinking, hey, well, you know, if I can get out of it, it's not so bad, and you get out of it. So you think, hey, I can keep going. No one needs to know. If no one knows, then what's the big deal? And we keep, like, building these Jenga piles in our lives where we're taking pieces of our integrity out and as we keep taking them out, we can start wondering, well, how long will this hold for? Will it ever fall? Or maybe we don't wonder that at all because we've gone on for so long. And we think, well, we just take these pieces out. We take these pieces out so like David did. David kept burying himself. He kept taking pieces of integrity out. He kept lying to try and get out of situations. And as he lies, people die. And as we start to make decisions like that too, we, start, we should start wondering, well, at what point is it going to collapse? Which I'm wondering right now as well. And as we wonder and we wonder and we wonder, eventually, it's just going to happen. And it crumbles. And we implode. And for David, that's what happened. It happened to the point where he's like, okay, I just got to get this guy killed. Because I got to get out of this. The easy thing for us to try and do is to try to think for ourselves, I know what's best, how do I get out of this situation? But the truth is that your solution can cause way more problems than you realize. And when we try to do it on our own, when we think that we know best, like David did, we ultimately implode. We might not see it happening, and it takes time, but when we choose to isolate ourselves from people who have wisdom who will challenge us, when we choose to let boredom lead us, and we just try to entertain ourselves or try to find fulfillment in things that don't really bring fulfillment, and then when we try to cover up or think we know best in our situations, eventually it comes falling down. And the truth is that we've all had moments where we've done something, whether we regret it or not, we know it wasn't the right choice. So what do we do with it? David had an opportunity, once he got Bathsheba pregnant, to do the right thing, to admit his wrong, to try and work things so that he just confessed and it would be fixed. Not that she wouldn't stop being pregnant, not that the fact that his integrity was damaged, but he could have made things better, but instead he tried to hide it. He tried to get out of it. Too often we try to get out of the wrong we've done, and we cause more problems than we realize. And eventually, it just all comes falling down. So what do we do? Do we try to just get out of it? Do we try to cover up our mistakes? Do we try to pretend like nothing happened? Well, I think what we need to do is when we find ourselves in moments, and we will, where maybe we didn't make the best choice, or maybe something's not working out the way we thought it would, instead of trying to cover it up, and try, instead of trying to fix it ourselves, we need to be asking ourselves, what is God's solution to this problem? David, at no point in his story, is consulting God. At no point as he's making these decisions to not go to war, to send Joab off, to sleep with Bathsheba, is there any indication that God is playing a role in his life? This person who's called the person after God's own heart, this person who wrote much of our prayer book in the book of Psalms, this person who was regarded and is regarded as an incredibly important person in the history of the church, this person who is in Jesus' lineage never consults God with the mistake he made. So what is God's solution to your problem is what we should be asking. And how do we find that? And I want to give you three C's. So keep it easy. Three C's on how we can do that. The first thing we should do is if when we find ourselves in situations, and hopefully you're not in a situation like David, 
Hopefully you're not in a situation where you've started to try and get out of something where you're basically leading to destruction. But there will be moments where you face a problem. And sometimes that problem is your own doing. So what do you do to get out of it? Well, First, you need to consider what the problem really is. What is the problem? For David, in those moments, he thought the problem was that she was pregnant. Not that he slept with her. For David, he thought, well, if I can just make it look like she didn't get pregnant by me, I'm out of this trouble. But if he was a person of integrity in those moments, and I do think David is a person of integrity, he just had a momentary lapse of poor decisions, he should have been considering, well, what did I do to get into this mess? Not how do I cover up this mess? The issue wasn't that she was pregnant. The issue is that he slept with her. He didn't actually address the problem. So when we face moments that we are going to get in or have been in, and maybe we need to do some backwards work on some stuff that we've done, we need to consider what the real issue is. What really happened? Maybe you lied. Maybe you thought it was no big deal to lie to your boss about why you didn't show up to work. But then they found out. So what are you going to say? What's the real problem? Is the problem that he found out or she found out? Or is the problem that you lied? Maybe you stole something. Was the problem that you got caught or that you stole something? When we can be honest about what the real issue is, we can start taking steps in the right direction to fix it. When we're trying to figure out what is God's solution to our problem, we got to start by considering what our problem really is. And it's not always someone else. Oftentimes it's us. So when you consider and when you recognize, okay, this is my real problem, you need to consult with people. Who are you talking to to say, hey, I messed up. What do you think about this? Who do you have in your life that is like jo- what Joab was, someone who had a level of integrity and wisdom and would challenge David when he was making poor choices? Who are you going to go to and say, I really messed up and I don't know how to fix this? If there's no one, chances are you'll just keep taking those Jenga pieces and piling on and making choices that lead to more problems than solutions. So as you are considering this, consult other people, but also we should be consulting the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit. God is present with us at all times. We should be talking to God, with God, about what's going on and not ignoring it. Confessing, being honest, trying to fix the situation, we should be talking to God. If you want to know what God's solution to the problem is, it really actually starts with him, and we need to go to him. And then once you maybe have been praying about it, you've been consulting with God, you've been consulting with other people, you've, you've honestly assessed, like, this is the real problem that I have here, this is the real issue, the third thing you should do is you should clarify your decisions with Scripture. You might think, okay, this is what God wants me to do. Um, I lied to my wife, so what I'm going to do to get out of it is tell more lies. And I think that's what God told me to do. Well, okay, that's great. You think that's what God told you to do. And maybe you consulted some people who said, hey, you should lie about this. Do not tell anybody about what you did. And you go, okay, well, they're saying it, and I think God's saying it because it sounds good to me because I think I know best. Well, you need to clarify that with Scripture. What does God actually say? God has spoken to us, and we have the gift of Scripture. Are there scenarios in the story of Scripture that are similar to yours? Like, hopefully you're not in a scenario where you got someone's wife pregnant, and then, you know, you tried to get them killed, like David. But if it was that scenario, you could go right to that story and go, wow, this is very similar. But are there other instances in Scripture or things that happen that parallel what you've gone through? And is there wisdom in that scripture to make sense of it? This, my belief is that the Bible is not written to us, like directly to us, but it is for our use. And so when we understand who it's written to and what they went through, and we can discern through that, we can see how it can be used in our lives to be followers of God. 
And so are there moments in Scripture that help us clarify the situation? Are there clear instructions from Jesus, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, that say, don't do this? Like, do not lie. That's a good one. Okay, then maybe I shouldn't keep lying to try and get out of this problem. Or do not murder. Okay, maybe I shouldn't get somebody's wife killed to get out of this problem. Right? So there might be clear, direct instruction. Is what you think everybody's telling you is right? Is what you think is right matching up with it? We need to clarify our decisions with what God has already said is best. If we ignore this step, we will continue to make poor decisions in so many areas of our lives. David was not clarifying things with God. He was ignoring God in the whole process. And when he did, it just made things worse. But we don't have to be like David with David's bad stuff. We can be like David with his good stuff, which we'll get to next week. We can make decisions to honestly admit to our wrongs. We can make decisions to seek the wisdom of other people to help us make good choices when we've made those wrongs and to seek the Holy Spirit's guidance to us. And then we can look to Scripture to be our guide because God does have a solution to our problems. And ultimately, that solution is found in Jesus. That in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we find the forgiveness of our sins. So what our decision was that led us to this path of destruction doesn't have to be the defining moment for our lives. Jesus has given us an opportunity to be different. But if we ignore him in our decisions, we lead to destruction. We have an opportunity to be better we have an opportunity to right wrongs. We don't have to ruin our lives. As we look at the life of David, thankfully his story didn't end with what he did to Uriah and how he impregnated Bathsheba. Thankfully, there's more to this chapter that we're going to look to next week and see what he did once there was no way of stopping the wrong from happening, what he did and how he realized that he had ruined his life and he needed to get back on track. And I can't wait to share that with you next week. But let's pray right now. God, I thank you that you are the God who is not the, defining us by our worst decisions. That you aren't a God who says, well, you messed up and there's no chance of fixing it. That in you, Jesus, there is always an opportunity to start fresh be forgiven, to be new. And that in you, Jesus, we can take our opportunity and then experience life in all of its fullness when we live a life that reflects you, is guided by you, and is loved by you. I pray this morning, God, that maybe some of us feel like we've gotten to a place where we have ruined our lives. We've made decisions We've lied, we've stolen, we've cheated, whatever it might be where we think there's no way back from this. I pray that as we may feel this, we know that that's not true. The truth is, there's always an opportunity for forgiveness in you, Jesus. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean that our mistakes aren't going to have consequences. But it does mean there's new opportunity to make right the wrongs we've done. And maybe we're wrestling with how do we make right the wrongs we've done. I pray, God, that we take the time to really consider what the wrong is. That we consult with you, Holy Spirit, and with people of wisdom and character. And that we clarify with Scripture how we should proceed, what we should do to make our wrongs right. And that even as it may be scary to do so, because we worry about hurt or pain or sorrow because of it, that we come to trust you to know that your way is best, and that when we follow your way, even though it's not easy, it is good. I thank you for leading us to the path of good. And I pray that we make choices today, tomorrow, and always that lead in that direction. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.